apologize for that. Let's uh, finish up the Krebs cycle and we will get into the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. So when I left you last time, we were uh, at one of the reactions where uh, fumarate, uh, actually uh, succinate gets converted into fumarate. And this is the sixth reaction. The sixth reaction. Oh, hold on here. Let me get my lines. There we go. So that was the sixth reaction of the Krebs cycle. And if you recall, it went something like this. Where you would have succinate being converted into fumarate. And this required FAD going to FADH2. I think your book has this as a Q going into um, reduced Q, coenzyme Q. I'll talk about this later, but the actual reaction that takes place on, these, on this uh, succinate substrate is going to be FAD. And I had mentioned that there's this business end of the FAD, which carries this out. So I'll, I'll rewrite this uh, with, the, with the reaction mechanism. I'm going to just draw the critical part of the cofactor. Oh, I don't like that. Hold on. Let me draw that again for you. There, that's better. And these are not S's here. These are just squiggly lines to show you that uh, the, the cofactor is much bigger than this. Okay, just, I just cut it off at the business end. And I said this is a, a, a single electron or single hydrogen movement, electron or hydrogen uh, atom movement. Hydrogen atom, the natural hydrogen atom, has a single proton and a single electron, and that makes it a neutral atom, right? So single proton, single electron. So here, instead of high drive movement, we're doing hydrogen atom movement. So I've drawn here an arrow with just half an arrowhead, and that means that a single electron is moving rather than an electron pair. So uh, we're going to create from this fumarate. So fumarate is going to be one of the uh, products. This is a double bond here. And what does our cofactor look like? Our cofactor will look like this. So 
now the cofactor has new uh, has two hydrogen atoms on it, and the double bonds have uh, shifted so that we have just a single double bond between this, between these uh, two rings, and we would call this the reduced form of FADH2. And why is it reduced? It's reduced because now it has two extra electrons on it. Those two extra electrons are coming from the hydrogen atoms that have been placed onto the cofactor. So we call this a reduced cofactor, NADH2. Whereas this is FAD. By the way, this FADH2, just to give you a preview, will feed into something called uh, complex two of the electron transport chain. So eventually those electrons will feed into complex two. Okay, the next reaction is a fumarate going to malate. This is the seventh reaction of the TCA cycle. And so here we've got um, so that's a fumarate and a water molecule comes in and we're going to create And you can imagine what the reaction here is going to be. Um, here we've got a couple of lone pairs of electrons on this water molecule. That's going to attack right here. You're going to make an intermediate where you have a carbo anion, where that's going to be negatively charged by just a bit. And then they're going to have a proton shift from the water onto this, uh, onto this uh, carbon. So this will come from water, and this will come from water. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, it's a very difficult pen to work with. Okay, I'll redraw this later for you guys. Hopefully you guys caught that. Um, the next reaction, oh, by the way, the name of this enzyme is called fumarase. So fumarase. is the name of this enzyme. For the sixth reaction, it's uh, called succinate dehydrogenase. Succinate dehydrogenase. Okay. And obviously that's an oxidoreductase -reducti reaction. Okay, next, going to the eighth reaction So in the eighth reaction, we have malate that's going to go to oxaloacetate. So we've got malate, which I just drew. This is going to require NAD plus and NADH plus a proton will be the products here. And we're going to produce oxaloacetate.
will produce oxaloacetate. Going on here, what is this? Okay. So this is malate, and this is oxaloacetate, and then the and then the cycle continues after that. Oxaloacetate will get together with two carbons that come from acetyl CoA, and so we will continue. All right. So that is the uh, Krebs cycle. I want to mention something about the Krebs cycle regulation. So this is from your book on page 612, uh, figure 14.16. And what you see here, let me just blow this up, is, these, uh, is the way in which this pathway is regulated. So pyruvate going to acetyl-CoA, that is uh, carried out by pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And you can see how there are these negative regulators here. And, and these negative regulators make a lot of sense. Here we have acetyl-CoA, which would be considered a product inhibitor or product inhibition because that is the, the direct product here. So we have acetyl-CoA that uh, could build up and prevent this reaction from going forward. We also have uh, NADH as well as ATP. ATP makes a lot of sense because this is a catabolic reaction, so you want to shut down uh, catabolism when you have plenty of ATP in the cell. And NADH also makes sense because NADH is um, a product also of this reaction. Uh, plus, NADH is uh, eventually going to be, if it builds up too much, it means you don't have very much electron transport going on after this. So this, this makes sense as a negative regulator. What about positive regulators? I'm just going to circle a couple of these. Uh, ADP and pyruvate, those are the ones that you should really know about. They make a lot of sense also. ADP is a sign of low energy charge when you have lots of ADP. So you want to increase uh, catabolism. And pyruvate is the substrate for this reaction. So that's also going to make this reaction go forward. Here you have a number of other negative regulators, which I have circled here. Uh, NADH, uh, NADH here, as well as ATP, and NADH in, in this step here. So there are a number of steps that are modulated by NADH. And I've also circled uh, ATP as a negative regulator from isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate, and ADP as a positive regulator. So ADP is a positive regulator of isocitrate going to alpha ketoglutarate. In the context of energy charge and what you guys know about catabolism and anabolism, these should make a lot of sense to you. Okay, so uh, what I did is I looked back at my old, uh, uh, nope, old textbooks and I was able to find a supplementary um, website which I've given to you on, in the notes here. So you can, you'll have the, that website available to you. And it's made from the 1990s, so uh, don't, don't um, laugh at this <laughs> animation, okay? So please don't laugh. But I think it uh, actually says a lot. There's no um, wonderful animation, and there's no uh, voice for this. But I think if you read it, this makes a lot of sense. Oh, let me get it on here. Hold on. Okay. Let me go back. OK. So. So I emailed this to myself, so I just press on the, <coughs> the uh, link, and it talks about the citric acid cycle, and there's different, uh, there's, there's different categories here. I like how they make this look as if you guys are like sitting in the matrix. You know, this is supposed to be the inner mitochondrial membrane here, all convoluted. I like that little style. 
Um, and then here you've got the overview where you've got polysaccharides coming to glucose and glucose um, in, encounters this enzyme. What's the name of this enzyme? Complex, very good, excellent, excellent, okay. And then that enzyme, of course, sits in the matrix of the mitochondria, and then we've got um, acetyl-CoA that's being produced from that, and the acetyl-CoA will enter into the citric acid cycle. I like how you've got this like shading of yellow kind of going through here, it looks, makes it look really cool. And then you've got the amino acid. So we didn't talk about this, but I, I want you to be aware that it's not just polysaccharides that lead to the citric acid cycle, proteins, if they break down, so there's uh, been situations where people have been stranded on islands or um, in, in the South Pole that have <coughs> not had uh, a lot of um, polysaccharides available. They had to exist off of capturing birds, and birds don't have very much fat, um, especially if they're in the wild, and so they were getting a lot of protein, and so they were basically using this pathway to feed into the citric acid cycle to supply energy for themselves, okay? So protein can also be broken down into amino acids. And of course, if we starve ourselves tremendously, so we deplete our polysaccharides and we deplete our fat source uh, stores, then we will start to break down muscle and that muscle will also lead to the citric acid cycle. So the, the body has ways of coping with extreme starvation, which to be honest, you know, hundreds of years ago was a fairly common uh, thing that would happen to human beings, okay? So it's only fairly recent in our evolution that we had plenty of food available. And then of course fats. Fats can also be uh, broken down and they are broken down to acetyl-CoA in two carbon unit um, uh, categories. So basically fatty, fatty acids are typically uh, long chain hydrocarbons, they have an even number, most of them have an even number of carbons, and they're just broken down two at a time, two at a time, two at a time, until you get to acetyl-CoA, and acetyl-CoA goes into the citric acid cycle. It's a beautiful system, really beautiful. Okay, uh, what do we have next here? So now we're gonna center in on the citric acid cycle, so we're getting a little bit closer Oh, this is nice because this actually is going to give us a preview of what's going to happen in the future. So we've got glucose being broken down to pyruvate through the process of glycolysis. We make a little bit of NADH. We make a little bit of ATP. Here um, is a situation where you have anaerobic conditions. Under anaerobic conditions where there's no oxygen around or, or little oxygen around, the pyruvate can be broken and can be converted into lactate. As a review, what is the purpose of pyruvate being converted into lactate? What is that purpose? I'm gonna remember. Why do we do that? Just for the fun of it, to make lactic acid? What is the purpose of pyruvate going to lactate? To regenerate NAD plus. That's exactly it. To reach, that's a beautiful answer. Regenerate NAD plus in order to be used for glycolysis. That's exactly right, okay? And of course, if we were yeast, but we're not yeast, uh, but if we were <coughs> yeast, we wouldn't, use, uh, <laughs> we wouldn't use lactate. We would actually convert this to ethanol, right? I'm sure you guys remember that, ethanol. Two-step process. That's how we get our bread. That's how we get uh, some wine, okay? So that's uh, another process, anaerobic. It's a great uh, slide, actually, now that I think about it. Pyruvate, then, under aerobic conditions, when you have plenty of oxygen around, that means we're ready to, to do oxidative phosphorylation. That pyruvate's going to go to pyruvic dehydrogenase complex. We get some NADH from that. We also remove a CO2 from the pyruvate. The pyruvate, then, is converted to acetyl-CoA, and then here we have the citric acid cycle. And now, we get into something that's... Um, we're going to be, be talking about shortly, and that is we've made lots and lots of NADH. We've made, uh, we've made some FADH2. We've made some GTP, which as I said before is the equivalent of ATP, and we've broken down this acetyl-CoA to two molecules of carbon dioxide. That is an oxidative process. The electrons from the acetyl-CoA end up ultimately 
in which of these factors? Which ones of these? Question. Where do the electrons from astro-CoA end up in? Here, here, or here? Number one, number two, or number three? Yeah. Number one, exactly. The electron's gonna end up over here in NADH and FADH2. I've talked about all the enzymes that make these, okay? And then those electrons are gonna feed into the electron transport chain, which sits embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And in that process, we're going to uh, convert oxygen into, actually the oxygen's gonna get reduced to water. And in that process, ADP and inorganic phosphate's gonna get converted to ATP. Something that you don't see here is there must be some kind of oxidative process, and the oxidative process is at NADH and FADH2 get converted back to their oxidized forms, NAD plus and FAD, okay? And they can be reused here, and they can also be reused way up here. Here we're kind of zeroing in on this. I've, I've gone through this, all of these uh, reactions, most of these reactions with you, those mechanisms. So you guys probably know this pretty well. Here we have a direct conversion of um, uh, succinyl-CoA to uh, GTP. That's going to be called substrate level phosphorylation. Here is a Ferris wheel animation. This was state of the art back in the 1990s, okay? So this was like cool, okay? <laughs> so, um, and it kind of tells you uh, what, what's actually happening at each step of this, okay? So you get these, these conversions here. Okay, and then here is oxaloacetate. Oh, wow, isn't that, what, what's going on here? What is, this is something new. Okay. So here's an interactive exercise that I suggest that you guys uh, do. It's kind of fun, um, except if you're up here teaching and you have all the eyes of your students looking at you, it's not that fun, but okay, here's oxaloacetate. I'm supposed to put this in the proper position in the Ferris wheel. So, um, okay. And it, it doesn't tell you if you're right until the very end, so I have to be really careful here. Um, isocitrate. Maybe that goes there. Alpha ketoglutarate. I'm thinking there. Oh, okay, citrate. That's a good one. Okay, <laughs> it goes up there. All right. Uh, let me get these little guys. Oh, no. No. Oh, malate. Malate, I know, is like the second to the last reaction because I just did that with you. So that's fresh in my mind. Okay. Fumarate, I just did that with you. So I know that goes right there. Okay, now here's the hard one. I'm always get confused on these. Uh, I think, yeah. And the succinate is going to go here. Okay, here's the moment of truth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right, all right. So I live to teach another day. <laughs> here we go. Next. I think that's the only test I have to go through. I get very sweaty here also because of that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's also a major source. Okay, so what do we got here? So we got energy. Oh, okay. It's going to tell you what the reactions are. And these are actually really good to read through. And it tells you where the uh, where, when you have uh, production of NADH. So that's cool. So uh, yeah, this is good. Let's look at, let's look at regulation. And exactly as your book said, when you have low energy charge, in other words, high levels of ANP or ADP, that's the basic rule, this reaction is going to go uh, forward. So these are called positive modulators. Okay. Let's see what happens if I remove the positive. Oh, okay. So it's the Ferris wheel slows down when I remove the positive modulators. So you can see that's happening. So now you have a lot less flux through this pathway. 
Let's go ahead and add some negative regulators. So these are the negative regulators, which I've talked about, some of these I've talked about. Okay. And so that's going to really slow down the pathway. That's when you have plenty of ATP in your cells. So you, you, you don't need to run through this, reaction, this uh, set of reactions very quickly. So the flux through this pathway is very low. And here we move them. OK. Here we've got uh, intermediates. And then finally, the pathway. I guess they're trying to say that uh, glycolysis is a linear pathway, whereas uh, citric acid cycle is a circular pathway. All right, so that's, oh my god, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about this. OK. Which of the following best represents a balanced equation for the stoichiometry of the citric acid cycle starting with acetyl CoA and proceeding through one cycle of the pathway? Okay, let me see if I can figure this out. Okay, A, I've got acetyl CoA. That is hard. Okay, hold on. Acetyl CoA. Well, I don't. Okay, wait. I know I get three NAD H's out of this, right? So, and I know that I get one FADH2. So that's what it looks like it's a variable. So I think I'm starting to like see. Okay, because I'm getting three NADH's and one FADH2, I like C. I'm starting to like C. Yeah. I'm, I'm liking C. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm feeling good. <laughs> I'm hoping there's not another question. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, so that's the tutorial. So go ahead and take a look at that. That might, that might help you. Okay, we are ready now to enter into um, chapter 15 here back on your book. And this is on page 626 of your book. And this is just to remind you kind of where we are in this uh, overall pathway. I like doing this, okay? So we kind of just went through this. But remember, uh, citric acid cycle is going to produce what are called reduced electron carriers. Those reduced electron carriers are NADH as well as FADH2. They're going to go into the electron transport chain. I guess some people call this respiratory chain because oxygen is going to be consumed here. So it's also known as the respiratory chain. I like electron transport chain a little bit better because I, I visualize electrons being moved through here. Respiratory chain is not as descriptive to me. And they're showing you a few of the carriers here. They're called flavins, iron sulfur centers, coenzyme Q, and cytochromes. We will, we will get into some details about these. And in this process, we have ADP and inorganic phosphate being converted to ATP and oxygen being reduced to water. And we're going to produce oxidized electron carriers, FAD plus and FAD. I'm sorry, NAD plus and FAD. Here's a little bit more descriptive diagram. By the way, remember we're in the mitochondria here. Okay? And so this is on page 627 of your book. We have really five protein complexes in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And they have Roman numerals after them. So go back to your Roman numerals to remember your Roman numerals. It it's not that difficult. Here's complex one. That's a protein complex. Several proteins are involved here. Complex two, several proteins are involved here. We have coenzyme Q, which is a very small lipid soluble molecule. Complex three. Cytochrome C, which is a single protein, complex four, and complex five. Most people don't call this complex five. Most people call this ATP synthase. This is really ATP synthase. 
This is not very common that you call this complex five. What's happening here? What's happening here is that uh, NADH is feeding into complex one. And upon doing that, uh, NADH is being stripped of its electrons and its, pro and its protons, okay? And in this process, complex one is translocating. So remember that word, translocating protons from the matrix into a part of the mitochondria known as the intermembrane space. I'm going to say that again. Intermembrane space. Why intermembrane? Because it's between two membranes, the outer membrane and the inner membrane. So it's called the intermembrane space. This is a very important area. Okay. Electrons are then uh, transported from one complex to the other um, through this electron trans. This this is the electron transport chain all the way up to complex four. That's called the electron transport chain. And as these electrons move, here's one of these electrons, as these electrons move, what happens is that more and more protons get translocated from the matrix into this intermembrane space. Okay? So we have three locations, complex one, complex three, complex four, where proton translocation, not protein, proton translocation occurs. Okay. In this process, we are actually increasing the concentration of protons in this intermembrane space. And that builds up a, a chemical and electrical gradient. Why is it chemical? It's chemical because you have more molecule or more atoms of protons on one side of the membrane versus the other. Why electrical? Why is this also an electrical gradient? It's an electrical gradient also because you have a net positive charge on the outside of this membrane and you have a net negative charge on the inside. So we call this an electrochemical gradient, yeah, electrochemical gradient, two things. Okay. Both of them drive ATP production. What's going to happen is that these protons eventually find themselves able to get back in to the matrix and they are attracted to the matrix because there's a net negative charge here in the matrix and also there is a low concentration of protons compared to the outside. So two things are driving these protons back into this matrix. But because this membrane is so tight, and don't count, don't, I don't know how it does it, but this membrane is so tight it doesn't allow protons to get through. Protons need to go through ATP synthase, and as they go through ATP synthase, the energy is, uh, of this translocation drives the production of ATP. And this is how we get the, the majority, the vast majority of our ATP in our bodies. The vast majority of our ATP is produced in this fashion. Why is it called oxidative phosphorylation? This process is called oxidative phosphorylation because NADH and FADH Two are being oxidized. That's the oxidized part. Why is it called phosphorylation? It's called phosphorylation because ADP is being phosphorylated. Okay. Where does oxygen hang out in all this stuff? We know that oxygen is required for this, but where, how, how does it involve in this whole process? Oxygen, as you may know, is a great attractor of electrons. Electrons love to go to oxygen. Oxygen is one of the most, um, it's, it's probably one of the best uh, molecules, because it is O2, uh, molecules for attracting electrons to itself. So oxygen 
is going to be the final resting place for the electrons that originated in NADH as well as FADH2. It's the final resting point for those electrons and oxygen gets reduced to water. You might be thinking, well, where did the hydrogen come from? There's plenty of protons in here. There are, I mean, I shouldn't say plenty, but there's some protons in here that allow for protons plus the electrons to reduce the oxygen into water. This is the reason why you and I need to have oxygen at all times uh, in order to breathe. This is, what, this is the, the whole reason why, why we need oxygen in the atmosphere to breathe. Okay, you might think, oh, that's a lot of detail. We're going to get into more detail. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's get into some more detail here. I'm going to uh, go back to some writing here. Is that right? Oh, before I do that, before I leave this, I want you to become familiar. Don't memorize it, but become familiar with this table this table. What is this table? This table harkens back to your second quarter of freshman chemistry. This is, these are called standard reduction potentials. You may remember this. You may have thought that you escaped it, but it's back. Okay. <laughs> standard reduction potentials. And of course, these are molecules that we're interested in because these are, these are life molecules. These are, these are molecules that you find in your body. So we're interested in some of these. I'm going to just point out a few highlights here. Okay, First of all, what are we looking at? We're looking at basically the ability of all of these molecules here on the left-hand side to attract electrons to themselves. Okay, And um, the better able that these molecules are able to attract electrons to themselves, the uh, higher the standard reduction potential is, okay? So if we go all the way to the very bottom of this, oh gosh, I don't have the numbers here, hold on, there we go. If I go all the way to the very bottom of this list, oxygen is basically the leader, okay? It is the, the top notch uh, uh, oxidant. Why is it the top notch oxidant? Because its value is 0.82, and that is a very, very high standard reduction potential. Okay. What about NADH? I talked about NADH, right? Uh, you would think that that would have a low reduction potential because it's going to give up its electrons. And that's exactly the case. If we, if we go up here and find out where NAD, I'm sorry, NAD, yeah, NAD plus, okay, has a very low ability to bind electrons, okay? So it's going to be right here, minus 0.32. In other words, this reduced form loves to give up electrons. Now all of these are written in the form as if they're being um, reduced. And that's how, that's how you write these standard reduction potentials. But at the end of the day, because this is much more negative than oxygen, this guy NADH is going to want to give up its electrons. Let's look at one more. FAD also has a pretty low uh, standard reduction potential. It is minus 0.22. So it also wants to give up its electrons to oxygen. Okay, we're going to work with these in just a second. This is on page 629 of your book. 629 of your book. Okay. So electron transport chain. Oh, you know what? Before before I, I move on to this part, I, there's one more part of the book that I would like to draw your attention to. And it builds on the previous diagram that I showed you at the mitochondria. And it is on page, let's see, 
Yeah, it's this one right here. Okay. This is on page 646 of your book. Okay. This has just a little more detail <coughs> of what's happening. It's a little bit different of a cartoon. Okay. Unfortunately, it doesn't show you complex two, but it does show you some things. First of all, let's orient ourselves. This is the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay. We have the matrix up here. So this is the matrix. You should really write matrix up here. That's really where the matrix is. And this is the intermembrane space. And let's see if this makes sense. Um, you see you've got a bunch of negative charges lined up here in the matrix. We have a lot of positive charges in the intermembrane space. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Why does it make sense? Because as I said, as long as you have NADH around, it's going to give up its uh, electrons and protons, and protons are going to be translocated to the intermembrane space. So you're going to get a net positive charge on, uh, on, this, on, this, out, on this intermembrane space region. Okay. What else I want to show you here? I want to show you that um, there are different numbers of protons that are being translocated as a single NADH is being stripped of its electrons. Okay? So we have basically uh, four protons that come through complex number one. We have four protons that come through complex number three. And we have two protons that come through complex number four. And then, um, and so basically that's 10, if you add all this stuff, that's 10 protons that come through for every NADH which is stripped of its electrons. <coughs> what else do we want to show you here? I want to show you that um, the, um, the number of ATP molecules that are produced from a single NADH according to this book, is 2.5. Books vary on this, actually. Okay, we'll, we'll use the number here, but it's interesting. I teach another biochemistry course where we use another book, and, this, and the number is slightly different. Okay? And people are still debating it. It, it depends on uh, which book you're looking at and which research you're looking at. Sometimes it's 2.5, sometimes it's 3. Okay? We will use 2.5 for this, for the sake of clarity, so I'm consistent with the book. 2.5 ATP molecules. I didn't show you FAD, uh, and it, this diagram doesn't show you FAD, but FAD basically feeds its electrons through complex number two, which sits right around here, and then to coenzyme Q right here. There are no protons that are translocated through complex number two. So FADH2, each FADH2 will only translocate six protons, six protons, okay, because it doesn't, doesn't uh, feed into complex number one. That means you get less ATP from FADH2. FADH2 is, is wimpy compared to NADH, okay? So NADH gives you more. As a matter of fact, for, for FADH2, you get about 1.5 ATP molecules because you're not able to translocate as many protons with FADH2. FADH2's standard reduction potential is not as negative as NADH. Okay, let's talk about the electron transport chain in some more detail. Okay, electron transport chain. <laughs> we have complex one. The name of this is called 
another name for this is called NADH coenzyme Q reductase. That's the name of this complex one. Let's see if this makes sense. Does that make sense? It really does make sense because NADH is the substrate. Coenzyme Q is the product. And what's happening to the coenzyme Q? It's being reduced. So this is a great name for this complex. What about complex two? Name of this is um, succinate coenzyme Q reductase. Complex number two comes into play by taking succinate, and I don't know if you remember this from the PREB cycle, but succinate gets converted into fumarate, and, e and FAD is converted to FADH2. That FADH2 feeds itself into complex number two, and so you go from succinate to FADH2, finally those electrons end up in coenzyme Q, so that's why we call this succinate coenzyme Q reductase. You would think they would use FADH2. That would make more sense, but can't, you can't ask for everything, okay? But succinate coenzyme Q reductase is this name. What about complex three? Complex three is called cytochrome C reductase. And that makes a lot of sense because uh, complex 3 will take the electrons from coenzyme Q and convert them uh, and, and actually use them to reduce cytochrome C. So cytochrome C is that single protein that sits there um, in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And finally, we've got complex four. And the name of that is cytochrome C oxidase. It's kind of odd. All the others are reductase, but uh, I guess instead of saying water reductase, because that's exactly what happens, water, not water, oxygen gets reduced. They say cytochrome C oxidase. So these are the names of these. Okay, we're ready now to talk about standard reduction potentials. Standard reduction potentials. And we have an equation for oxidation of NADH that's basically like this. We, we have NADH plus a proton plus oxygen, molecular oxygen, is going to give you NAD plus plus H2O. Now, of course, this is not direct. I've already shown you that this is not a direct reaction. But at the end of the day, this is what's going to happen. After you sum up all the reactions, starting from NADH and ending with, ending with oxygen, this is the, the reaction. And if you look at that table that I gave you, the standard reduction potential, which is E with this plimsoll sign with this um, diacritic mark, that's going to be equal uh, for for NAD 
plus, I'll write that down here, that's going to be equal to zero minus 0 0.32 volts. And from that table that I showed you, the standard reduction potential table, for water, for oxygen, the standard reduction potential is a plus 0.82 volts. And there's an equation that we can use to relate these values to figuring out what is the standard delta G, standard free energy. And that equation is standard free energy, change in standard free energy is going to be equal to minus N F in the change of standard reduction potential. Okay, and I'm going to define these and I'll let you go. Okay. N equals number of electrons transferred Actually, I misspelled that transferred F is the Faraday constant And that Faraday constant is uh, 96.5 kilojoules per volt per mole. And then finally, delta E, change in standard reduction potential, is going to be equal to the standard reduction potential of the acceptor, electron acceptor minus the standard reduction potential of the donor. Okay. And of course, in our case, the acceptor has got to be oxygen. That's going to be 0.82 and then minus a minus 0.32. And you guys can figure out what is the um, change in standard free energy based on this value. <coughs> I will see you on Wednesday.